Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is that you're listening to this episode. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, and today we are going to talk about what makes Christianity different, unique from all other world religions. I trust that it'll be a good summary, comparison and contrast to the world religions, and really bring this series on the world religions to an end. We've discussed the subjects of Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and animism. And today I'm going to share about why Christianity is different, why it's unique from all of these before-mentioned religions and every other world religion and worldview. This is a presentation that I've given at various churches and in teaching classrooms, Sunday schools. And if this is something that you would like to have presented at your local church, Sunday school, Bible study, you can contact me at pweaver at dts.edu, pweaver at dts.edu. I believe this is a subject that resonates and is important for us to hear and understand because inevitably you're going to be asked, why do you say Christianity is different? Why do you say that your religion is unique and different from every other world religion? And after all, don't all religions lead to the same final destination? Well, we need to be able to give an answer for the hope that is within us. 1 Peter 3.15 we read, Be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And we need to do that with grace and truth. During our time together, I'm going to answer the question, What makes Christianity different from every other world religion? And I'm going to provide you with four answers to that very important question that I hope you will commit to memory. Because if you haven't already, you will be asked, Why do you say that Christianity is the only way? Or, the question put another way, don't all roads lead to heaven? Aren't all religions equal and legitimate options? Maybe you're not a believer in Christianity, but you are seeking truth. Well, I hope this session will help to answer some of your questions about Christianity. And certainly, my prayer is that you would embrace Christianity as your own. Now, we live in a pluralistic society where the word tolerance is thrown around regularly. We live in a world that if you say that all roads are not equal and that all lifestyle choices are not legitimate, you will receive the title of spiritual bigot. This is the day and age we live in. So, are we Christians simply intolerant, behind the times, and closed-minded spiritual bigots? Well, Jewish Rabbi Shmuley would have you to believe this to be true. One morning newspaper has written that Rabbi Shmuley is arguably the most famous rabbi in America. He's one of the country's most sought after television and radio guests and had a program that aired on the TLC network called Shalom in the Home. Shalom, of course, is Hebrew for peace, and Rabbi Shmuley was on a well-meaning mission to bring peace back into the homes of America to help families get along together. Well, Rabbi Shmuley was in a debate Being a Jewish Orthodox rabbi, he was in a debate with one of my professors from Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, I had the opportunity to watch this debate live over the internet at 2 a.m. because I was in Hungary as a missionary at the time. So due to the time zone difference, I was awake at 2 a.m. to listen to and to watch this debate. This debate was supposed to be about an entirely different topic, but Rabbi Shmuley really took control, hijacked the debate, and changed the topic entirely. Rabbi Shmuley had a different axe to grind. Rabbi Shmuley proceeded to portray my Protestant evangelical professor as an intolerant spiritual bigot. Several times, Rabbi Shmuley looked over at my former professor and said, Admit to me that you believe I'm going to hell. And the response in the crowd was similar to that moment of silence. You could hear a pin drop. Rabbi Shmuley proceeded to say, I'm willing to admit that you, if you're a righteous person, are going to go to heaven. Admit to me that you believe I'm destined to hell. Rabbi Shmuley said that he was a religious bigot because of his intolerance. What makes Christianity unique, different from all other world religions? Why can't we just accept other 
religions as equal and legitimate options. In the day in which we live, this is the question that you're going to face over and over again, and we must have a clear, cogent, reasonable, biblical answer. A response characterized by humility and grace, but one that does not waver from the truth. So again, my hope in this session is to give you four answers to this very important question. What makes Christianity different from all other world religions? Now, if you go to our YouTube channel and watch this video, I will include visual components and my PowerPoint to this presentation. The first thing that makes Christianity unique from all other world religions is the message of Christ. By the way, all four of these points, by no surprise, center on the person of Jesus Christ. The first thing that makes Christianity unique from all other world religions is the message of Christ. The first passage of scripture that I would like to look at is John chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. And the words recorded in John 14, 1 to 6 took place in the upper room just minutes after Jesus told Peter in the presence of the other disciples. Peter was going to deny him three times. And just hours after this conversation, Jesus would be betrayed by Judas. In the middle of these two tragic events, Jesus seeks to calm and encourage his disciples with these words. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Thomas responds, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Here's our verse. In verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The message of Christ is indeed an exclusive message. Notice Jesus did not say, I am a way to eternal life, along with other ways to eternal life like Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, and the rest, many of which aren't in existence yet at the time. The article there is very important and very exclusive. I am the way. He didn't say, I am a source of truth, like the Quran of Islam, or the Vedas and Vedantas of Hinduism, or the teachings of Buddha known as the Pali Canon. He said, I am the truth. He didn't say, I am a path to eternal life, like all other supposed alternatives. He said, I am the life. And if for some reason that it's still not clear for us, Jesus restated, no one, no one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus left no room for interpretation. He could not have said it any clearer. He made it crystal clear. God the Father, in his sovereign plan, determined that if someone wanted to attain peace with him, they must go through his son. Now, truth by its very definition excludes. The most basic laws of logic dictates that to be true. For something to be true, it requires other statements opposite of it not to be true. For me to say that I am recording this podcast in Forney, Texas, means that I cannot say I am not recording this podcast in Forney, Texas. These are mutually exclusive statements. Truth, by its very definition, excludes. For Jesus' message to be true, and it is, then Hinduism, which holds to a plurality of gods, many different gods, cannot be true. For Jesus' message to be true, and it is, then the teaching of Buddhism, that there is no God and everything is just an illusion, is not true. For Jesus' message to be true, and it is, than the teaching of Islam that Muhammad is the greatest prophet and obedience to his commands are required cannot be true. For Jesus' message to be true, and it is, than the teaching of animism, or indigenous people groups, tribal religions, that man cannot have a personal relationship with the Creator, that cannot be true. For Jesus' message to be true, and it is, than the teaching of Catholicism that we gain enough grace through sacraments to get to heaven cannot be true. For Jesus' message to be true, and it is, then the teaching of rabbinic Judaism, that one will escape judgment and be rewarded if they live righteously in this life, cannot be true. Rabbi Shmuley, 
in the debate before mentioned stated, I don't want Christ's righteousness. I want my righteousness. As I listened to those words come out of Rabbi Shmuley's mouth at about 2 a.m. in the morning, I could not help but weep for Rabbi Shmuley. Rabbi Shmuley missed the whole purpose of the Hebrew Scriptures. The law was to point to the fact that he is incapable of doing anything righteous and worthy of salvation, as are all of us incapable. In the book of Romans, Paul quotes from the Old Testament, Psalm 13, when he says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. In another book, Paul writes, Cursed is a man who doesn't do everything in the law. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I have Christ's righteousness. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we who know sin so very well receive Christ's righteousness. When we place our faith in Christ, our sin is placed on Christ, and Christ's righteousness is placed on us. That's the great exchange. It's not fair, but it's merciful. You see, all roads do not lead to heaven. All religions are not equal. All options are not legitimate. Truth, by its very nature, excludes. Now, we know that none of the scriptures were actually written by Jesus Christ himself. They were written by his apostles and close associates of apostles. However, he promised the twelve, the twelve disciples, or the twelve apostles in John 14, that he would send the Holy Spirit to bring to their memories the things that he had taught them. So we can expect the teachings of the apostles to match the teachings of Jesus recorded in John chapter 14, and of course, that is exactly what we find. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Peter and John repeat Jesus' exclusive message. In this passage, Peter and John are arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin and before Caiaphas, the very same Caiaphas who handed Jesus over to be crucified, the very same Caiaphas who stood in judgment over Jesus. Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin demanded that Peter and John stop preaching the message of Christ. Peter and John refused. They said, we cannot and we will not stop preaching the message of salvation through Jesus Christ because, and I quote, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Not only is Jesus' message exclusive, and not only does Peter and John repeat Jesus' exclusive message, but Paul repeats Jesus' exclusive message. Romans 10, 13 to 15. Now, Paul was not one of the original apostles, but he was tutored by Jesus himself. He saw the post-resurrected Jesus and was trained by him in Arabia for around three years. And he calls himself the apostle born out of due season. Well, in Romans 10, 13 to 15, we read Paul's letter to the Romans, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Jesus said it, and Peter, John, and Paul repeat it. There is one way to the Father, and that is through the Son, Jesus Christ. My favorite preacher, H.B. Charles, said it this way, clearly and concisely, you don't get to heaven by multiple choice. I know I've spent a good amount of time on this first point, but it's intentional because it is entirely countercultural. To say there's only one way is not going to help you make friends and influence people. But it is true, and we must stand on the side of truth, no matter how well it is received by our peers and our culture. The second thing that makes Christianity unique from all other world religions, in addition to the message of Christ, is the character of Christ. One apologist has put it this way, the entire life of anyone making prophetic or divine claims must be observed in concert with the teaching offered. This is precisely what makes Jesus so unique. In other words, if you claim to be a prophet of God, and especially if you claim to be God himself, which Jesus did, you better live what you preach. No human being, the exception of Jesus himself, has ever consistently lived out his own teaching. I think of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the French-Swiss philosopher. He wrote extensively on parenting, but he did not adhere to his own message. He had 11 illegitimate children. 
Rousseau was not identical with his message. Siddhartha, a.k.a. Buddha, the supposed enlightened one, he reached enlightenment and rose above his pain. But historians believe he died after eating poisonous mushrooms by accident. Siddhartha was not identical with his message. Muhammad preached that men could have four wives, but he took 11 wives at one time, and the youngest was nine years old when he consummated the relationship. Muhammad was definitely not identical with his message. No human being apart from Christ is identical with his or her message, not even your pastor or missionaries. There is only one person that lived on the planet who was identical with his message, and that is the God-man, Jesus Christ. Jesus was identical with his message. Jesus did not just expound his message, he was identical with it. He who preached on being a servant was the lowliest of servants, washing his disciples' feet. He who preached on humility died the most humiliating death reserved only for the worst of criminals. He who taught his disciples to pray was the example of prayer by getting up early in the morning to pray. He who taught about forgiveness while hanging on the cross said to God the Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What makes Christianity unique from all other world religions? The message of Christ. The character of Christ. Thirdly, the resurrection of Christ. All the authorities needed to do to disprove the predictions of Jesus and prevent the rapid growth and spread of the gospel was to produce Jesus' body. But they were incapable of doing so even after sealing the tomb and posting soldiers in front of it. Luke informs us in the book of Acts that Christ appeared over 40 days. That's in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And I quote, After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. What were some of those convincing proofs? Boy, would I have liked to have been there. Well, certainly just his appearance, probably the marks from the crucifixion, we're left to wonder what other convincing proofs, but as Luke says, there were many. Not only were there many, but Jesus appeared over 40 days. And Paul informs us that in just one of those appearances, he appeared to 500 men, not including women and children, probably. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. Counting women and children, it may have been upwards of 1,500. And I quote, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. The religious leaders could not stop the growth of the church. They could not make up a big enough lie to conceal the resurrection. Because Christ had appeared to so many, over 500 men on just one of those occasions. In fact, Paul the Apostle says, If you do not believe my witness, go ahead, go speak to one of the 500 plus people, many of which are still alive today. The disciples, who were fearful men, scattered at the crucifixion of Jesus, became bold martyrs for Jesus Christ, having seen the resurrected Christ and having received the Holy Spirit. Simon Greenleaf was a professor of law at Harvard University in the 18th century. He was challenged by a student to prove that the resurrection did not occur. He sought out to prove this student wrong, and as a result, he came to faith in Christ having studied the record. He writes as only an attorney would, in the language that he uses in his book, The Testimony of the Four Eyewitnesses, no unbiased jury would ever reject the resurrection of Christ. It is one of the most well-attested facts of history. I think of Lee Strobel author of the book Case for Christ, and his story was developed into the movie by the same name. He was a journalist who investigated the evidence for the resurrection to prove his wife wrong. His wife had come to faith in Christ. But instead of proving his wife wrong, having investigated as a journalist using journalistic principles, he instead came to faith in Christ. J. Warner Wallace is the author of Cold Case Christianity. He was an atheist, police detective. He would examine cold case homicides, cases that were never solved, and he would try to re-examine and solve them. J. Warner Wallace became a Christian at the age of 35 after applying the principles as a detective of cold cases to the claims of Christianity and the four Gospels. 
Chuck Colson, most famous for his part in the Watergate scandal under President Richard Nixon, he was known as Nixon's hatchet man. Due to his part in obstructing justice, he was placed in jail. While in jail, he came to faith in Christ. By the way, that's the best thing that could have ever happened to him, to be put in prison, because it was there he came to faith in Christ. He writes, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because twelve men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed the truth for forty years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, and stoned and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled twelve of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me twelve apostles could keep alive for forty years? Absolutely impossible. I take the twelve to be a reference to Matthias, who is a replacement for Judas. So we have professor of law applying the principles of jurisprudence, a journalist applying the principles of journalism, a cold case detective applying the principles of cold case detective, and a politician that's familiar with what you will and won't do for self-preservation. All come to the conclusion the historical record points to Jesus having risen from the grave. What makes Christianity unique from all other world religions? The message of Christ, Jesus' message, was exclusive. What makes Christianity unique from all other world religions? The character of Christ. Jesus was identical with his message. What makes Christianity unique from all other world religions? The resurrection of Christ, something that can't be replicated by any world religion. Fourth and finally, what makes Christianity unique from all other world religions? The provision of Christ. All man-made religions boil down to works. Do, do, do. Christianity is about done, done, done. Judaism is about being righteous enough. Hinduism, acquiring enough good karma over multiple lifetimes through reincarnation of life, death, birth, life, death, birth, life, death, birth, life, death. Hinduism, acquiring enough good karma. Buddhism, meditating long enough and hard enough and in the right position. Islam, obeying the five pillars of Islam. Catholicism, doing the sacraments to get grace. And even many Protestants, doing good works, baptism, church membership. Biblical Christianity is about grace. It's not about what I can do. It is all about what Christ has done. All other man-made religions are about do, do, do. Christianity is about done, done, done. One of my favorite theologians, Charles Ryrie, puts it this way, the direction of the gospel is from Christ to me. It's never from me to him. What could I possibly offer that would help meet my need? I have three applications for us today, and we'll be done. First of all, are you like Rabbi Shmuley, depending on your righteousness? If so, I must kindly inform you that your trust is misplaced because you cannot be righteous enough to appease a holy God. But praise the Lord, we have one in Christ Jesus who was righteous enough and has provided a way that we can by faith accept his righteousness in our place. Will you do that today? Second, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, we must be able to give account for the hope that is in us with gentleness and respect. I'd like to challenge you to commit to memory these four points, not that these points are inspired, but at least determine that you will learn how to articulate the concepts behind these four points so that you can carefully and humbly share them with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, and pray for opportunities to share the message of Christ, the character of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the provision of Christ makes Christianity different, unique from all other world religions. Finally, we can and should be prepared to face opposition to this message. We live in a pluralistic world that says all options are legitimate and equal. All religions lead to the same final destination, but we cannot be quiet because there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Well, thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. I hope you'll join us again next week for another great podcast. Would you help us get this message out? 
help other people to learn about the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, you can do that simply by subscribing to our YouTube channel, subscribing to this podcast wherever it is that you listen to your podcast at, and leave us a review or comment. These actions will help our podcast become more accessible to those who are looking for faith-building content. Well, until next time, never forget, Bible and Theology Matters, because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.